book of Acts chapter 12 and verse 7. Now behold, an angel of the Lord stood by him, and light shone in the prison, and struck Peter on the side and raised him up, saying, Arise quickly. And his chains fell off, off of his hands. I'll just quickly say this prayer out loud after me. Say, Lord Jesus, open my heart to your word. Lord Jesus, open my heart to your spirit. Lord Jesus, open my heart to your faith. Amen. I want to briefly um, speak to you on this topic of prison break. And this comes from the story of Apostle Peter, when the Bible says that Apostle Peter was locked in the prison by Herod. And because the next day was the Passover, they couldn't execute him. But what they did is they left him there to be there for a night. And the next day he was supposed to be executed. Now, Apostle Peter, before that, in chapter 12 of book of Acts, we see that in the verse 1 and lower, we see that the other apostle, James, he was executed by Herod because he was a leader of the church. And so you can imagine that Apostle Peter over here is being, you know, put into prison. And Apostle Peter most likely has, you know, thoughts that if James got executed, James got beheaded, most likely similar thing can happen to me. And the only reason he couldn't be executed right away is because of the Jewish holiday. So he remained in prison and the next day he was supposed to be executed. I mean, imagine sitting on a death row knowing the next day is your day of execution. It is very frightening and a very terrifying moment even for Apostle Peter. But the amazing part is though James was executed by Herod, God did not have that idea for Apostle Peter. And Apostle Peter is not going to have exactly the same thing as James. Chapter 12 starts out to say that James, this is what happened to James, but then God goes in and he completely changes the story of Peter and Peter's destiny, Peter's future is not exactly the same as James' past. And I want us to learn today something from the beginning is that you cannot get clues about your future from your past. Many times as Christians, we begin to look behind our past to try to see that something in our future will happen as it happened in our past. As a Christian, you must understand that it's not your past that determines your future. It is God who determines your future. And just because James died by execution, it doesn't mean that Peter will die by execution because the God who maybe was like, well, God didn't step in for James and so maybe God will not step in for Peter. But as Christians, we don't base our faith on what God did not do for James. We base our faith on the fact that God is faithful and his character doesn't change us and we trust that he will step in for us. Your past can be repeated. Your past can be duplicated. But as a Christian, you must understand that your future does not look for clues in your past. But the difference between Peter and the difference between James is that we see James, when James was, went to the trial, we don't see the church praying and fervently seeking God. But we see when Peter is going to a trial, the church starts to pray and the church starts to see God's face. Because they realize we don't want same thing to happen to Peter as it happened to James. I want to tell you something is that when you live a life of prayer, you let God affect your future instead of getting clues for your future from your past. Prayer causes the past not to be repeated, but for God to change and shift the things in our future for our good and for His glory. When we don't live a life of prayer, what's going to happen is that our past tends to repeat itself. When we don't live a life of seeking God's face, our past will repeat itself. There was a guy, his name is um, Kinsley. And one day he was driving from home. And uh, this story comes from the ministry of Prophet T.B. Joshua. As he was driving from home, he dropped off his wife at, at, at the house. And he went to pick up some other things in the storage and was supposed to come back to his house. As he was driving, he noticed there were people following him. And every stop he made, they stopped. Every turn he, they, he made, they turned. And so knowing that they're following him, instead of driving into his house, he passed his house. And as he is driving through, other people block his car. And guys come out with, you know, AK-47 and they 
they loaded guns facing at him and they tap on his window says lower down the window and so he's you know screaming inside of the car he's like what do you want from me I'm not gonna lower down the window well they pointed a gun at him so he lowered down the window they said get out of the car he got out of the car and he says you know what do you guys want from me and wealthy man and so they got into his car but the issue is that when he got out of the car and got outside somewhere in between him him and outside he somehow lost his keys so now they're looking for the keys to, to steal his car, but he doesn't have the keys. He doesn't know where he lost the keys, literally within a few feet. And God causes them to go blind and not to be able to find keys within a few feet from the car. So they're upset and they're like literally beating him, trying to threaten him. They will do this and this to you. And one gentleman goes in and wants to, you know, start the car without the keys, you know, cutting a few wires. As he does that, something hits him physically. He runs out screaming, saying, there's somebody there in that car. The other gentleman comes in and same thing begins to happen to him. The interesting part is this gentleman Kingsley who's an evangelist laying over there on the floor. His car being taken and his life is about to be taken. He is there sitting and he's like, oh God, please rescue me. And he begins to confess his sins. He's like, because he knows he most likely is going to die. He said, Lord Jesus, I forgive you. I ask you to forgive me all my sins. And I want to be welcomed by you into your kingdom when I die. When they could not take the car, they come to him and they decided to shoot him. And so they, you know, loaded, loaded the gun and he said, I'm a, I'm a man who knowledgeable in guns and he used to be in military. So he's like, I know how this stuff works. And when I saw that this guy had bullets and he pointed the gun at him and the gun wouldn't shoot. They took the gun and shot in the air. The bullets came out. They, sh they point at his head and the bullet doesn't come out. Wow. And the brother keeps praying and he said, Lord God, please help me. Not just to go to heaven, get, get me out of this. Because I'm realizing most likely I'm not going to die today. But please help me to get out of this situation. He gets up from the floor, faces the guys who's supposed to kill him. And he said, hey guys, this is not your lucky day. He said, God is on my side. And he says, you guys better leave me. Hallelujah. They point the gun one more time. And they said, well, maybe it worked. Some charm that you have on your life, it's going to work first time, but it's not going to work the second time. The guy takes a little scarlet thing charm around him. He says, now your charm is not going to work. He points at him one more time, wants to shoot, but it doesn't shoot. And next thing that happens, a siren breaks out and they think a police is coming. So they pack their bags and run from that place. But it wasn't a police, it was one driver and I don't know where the siren came, he pulled in, he says, hey what's happening here? Not realizing that God used that as a distraction to drive him away. See how could God change somebody's future? When you pray, your past does not determine your future, God determines your future. Can somebody say amen. A prayer might not change your past, but a prayer can alter your future whatever you have in your life like Sylvia shared today listen you must understand no problem is too small or too big to baptize it in prayer every single day whatever you're facing in your life bring it to God in prayer a man who was dying on the cross with Jesus sinner going to hell he knew I cannot change my past but if I'm gonna stop praying I'm gonna start talking to Jesus I can alter my future and when he opened his lips and said Jesus could you remember me in the paradise the Bible says Jesus looks back at him and says listen today you will be with me in the paradise your past does not have to repeat itself when you pray your past can be maybe unchanged but your future will be altered by a mighty God every prayer that is not prayed is the prayer that will not be answered God answers prayers that are prayed not prayers that are well I wish maybe I should you have to pray. The church prayed, God moved. If you're facing an illness right now in your body, pray. When you're facing a joblessness, pray. The Bible says that if I, if my people who are called by my name, if they will humble themselves, turn from their evil ways and pray, God says, I will forgive their sin. I will heal their land. God is going to move when we pray. Can somebody say amen? amen? We learn another thing from Peter is that while Peter is in this prison and the Bible says that when the angel of the Lord begins to come they find Peter sleeping in this prison. Now we must keep something in mind about Peter. Peter by nature is very aggressive man. Peter by nature is that man that when Jesus was sleeping in a storm Peter got so upset with the rest of the disciples came to Jesus woke him up and says Jesus how dare you can sleep when we are perishing. He accused Jesus of being careless in the storm. 
because Jesus slept in the storm. Now Peter sleeps in his own storm. The very thing he accused Jesus of, he's doing himself now. It is not natural for Peter to be peaceful in the place of chaos. Peter in the place of chaos goes ballistic. Peter in the place of chaos goes worried on steroids, afraid, anxious. But you see Peter could literally put a countdown on his iPhone and count hours and minutes before his head would be removed and Peter has the audacity to sleep. Why? Because Peter's faith finally matured. Peter is finally becoming less like Peter and more like Jesus. Before when Peter wants to get something done he cuts people's ears off. Before when Peter gets something done he cusses people out. When Peter wants something done, I mean he was aggressive. He is that man that's always full of passion and emotion and you see facing his death and Peter is taking a nap. A faith that caused him to sleep. A faith that caused him to rest and I think during that night Peter learned something that it took him a while to learn and it's going to take you a while to learn as well is that peace is not absence of conflict. Peace is the presence of God. Peace is not when everything is good in your life. Peace is when God is good and he never leaves your side. And if Peter can sleep in prison facing a death sentence and Jesus can sleep in a storm facing death, you can sleep in your situation not out of carelessness but out of full complete trust that God is under control and God has got a whole universe in the palm of his hand. He sure can handle your life. Can somebody say amen? amen. The faith that can sleep in a storm is the faith that can speak to the storm. The reason why Jesus could speak to the storm is because Jesus could sleep in the storm. The reason why Jesus could stop the storm is because Jesus could rest in the storm. Jesus got up and said peace be still and peace that was inside of him was the peace that filled the storm. Whatever you're carrying is the only thing that you can release and the real faith is not when only you can pray. It's interesting that the church was fully awakened in prayer during this time. Typically and naturally the church is more sleeping. The church is a prayerful church but at the same time you must understand the church is made out of individuals and who all are busy, who all have their lives and they don't have time to come every single day to pray. But now we see the church is praying every single moment. Constant prayer the Bible says is offered. It means the church is fully awake. Faith woke them up but the same faith that woke up the church puts the man to sleep. Because it's not natural for church to be so aggressive and something that is not so aggressive becomes aggressive and someone who is aggressive becomes calm. Because faith makes you act unlike you. You are by nature maybe worried. By nature you are the person who is so stressed out. But when faith kicks in, you become unlike you. You become not like you. You become unrecognizable part of you. Why? Because you are maturing in faith. In the beginning your faith will not be like that. In the beginning your faith will be like Peter's faith. Wake up Jesus we are dying. That's gonna be your faith but it's okay. But the bad part is when that faith remains like that for 20 years. There has to be a miracle in your faith life. You know the greatest miracle is not only what happened when Peter got out supernaturally from the prison. It's the fact that we meet Peter in the prison sleeping. That is a miracle in itself. And like Bishop Andrew, he was saying that the miracle that God wants to do, God wants to change us and through that he wants to change the world. As you are waiting for God to break you out of your prison, can I remind you something? While you are there, learn how to find God peace in the chaos. Learn how to find God's rest when everything is going crazy. Learn how to sleep while you're waiting for your wife Adam because maybe in your sleep God will do something that you could not do when you were awake. We must learn to find rest in God when everything is breaking crazy around us. We must learn that rest and peace is not by product of a good life. Rest and peace is by product of a good relationship with a good God who has good things for you in Jesus name. If we go on and we see that not only Peter has peace in the storm but the Bible says because of the prayers of people God sends a messenger to Peter. An angel of the Lord comes to Peter and this angel carries a message. 
carries a power and brings a miracle into Peter's life. The way God answered a prayer to Peter is that he sent a messenger. And what I want to just underline to you is the messengers precede miracles. We all are anxious, interested, and we all want miracles in our lives. But we must understand that God's way of bringing miracles many times is by sending a messenger into your life who becomes the answer to your prayer. And this messenger not only becomes an answer to your prayer, but this messenger also becomes a key to a prison door. Now we have a tendency as Christians to kill messengers. Jesus looked at Jerusalem with weeping and he said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, whom I have not sent to you. He says, and everyone I send to you, either stone them, kill them, or crucify them. He says, I wanted to gather your children. I wanted to restore you. I wanted to heal you. I wanted to get you out. I wanted to bring a miracle into your life. But the problem is that I don't bring miracle. I bring a messenger who brings a miracle. And you kill the messenger and you jeopardize the miracle. If you want a miracle in your life, you must pay attention to the messages that are sent in your way. Lot, if you are in Sodom and Gomorrah and you want to leave Sodom and Gomorrah, remember God is not going to send an angel. He is going to send a messenger into Sodom and Gomorrah that might look like a friend or might look like a human. And if you pay attention to the messenger, you can escape the wrath of God in Sodom and Gomorrah. When God is about to do something, God will send a messenger. The presence of a messenger in your prison is a sign, it's a symptom, it's a smell of a miracle that is coming your way. When you have a messenger in your life, when you have a person in your life who speaks from God and who encourages you, challenges you, and you have a person who carries God into your situation, who encourages your faith, you are on the edge of a miracle in your life. Before God brought Jesus into Mary's womb, he brought a messenger. And what did Mary say? Mary says, yes sir. Zechariah when the messenger came and said you are gonna have a child and Zechariah is like hey I have my will written down I already chose my casket I'm ready to go and you're talking about a child he says no 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 and the messenger says listen you don't you mess with me and the messenger says you know what man you, you you're so stubborn Zechariah I'm gonna make you mute for that you, you ticked me off be careful how you treat the messenger because in ignoring the messenger you actually will could miss a miracle in your life there was one one lady she grew up in a, in a religious home that was kicked out of the organization religious organization that they were a part of because her parents committed some sins and after that she lost her way with God and she started to go the wrong way she started to go in the way of alcohol in the way of drugs and went heavy very heavy into drugs to that degree that she became colorblind she was not able to see color. She only saw black and white. She became very fatigued in her body. She started to lose strength and for her to get up from the chair and to walk required enormous amount of courage and physical strength. Drugs took everything away from her and the worst thing they took from her, the biggest thing they took from her is a sense of hope and purpose. Until she found a place that has a, had a ceiling pretty, pretty high up and she tied a rope around the ceiling and decided to climb on the ladder and throw herself from the ladder so she can kill herself and take her life and end her misery and as she planned for that she got as she got up on the top of the ladder to throw herself she started hearing voices one voice said don't do it there's people who care about you and there are people who will really be discouraged and the other voice says you know what your life is pointless and pathetic anyway just throw yourself and she threw herself from the ladder as she's hanging there grasping for air wanting to end her life it happened an accident a person walked by in the hall and for reasons unknown to him he decides to without an invitation walk into the room where she just 30 seconds stepped out of the ladder he climbs on the ladder cuts the rope and brings her down brings her to emergency room and she's upset because here she wants to end her life here she wants to die in her prison and there is someone who came in as a messenger into her prison and cut the rope and eventually few years later God started to deal with her and set her free from that her collar was restored and she became free and now she lives a completely free woman but my friend miracles bring 
are brought by messengers. You must understand if we want to have a miracle in our life, pay attention to the messenger God is going to send into your life. That's why if we want to have miracles, we have to have messengers in our life. You got to have them on your phone. You got to have them on your blogs. You got to have them on your Facebook. You got to have them when you wake up and when you go to sleep. Why? Because a messenger is the key to your prison. And somebody say amen. amen. When God was about to bless Peter with some money, he told Peter, he said, go into the river and find a fish and the fish will have money in its mouth for you. We must understand that if you want to have certain things in your life, you got to look for a messenger because many times the messenger will have something in his mouth that you're desperately looking for and needing for at this point in your life. When we learn to appreciate the messengers God sends in our life, we will soon unlock the potential of God's miracles in our lower life for the glory of God. Can somebody say amen? If we go on and we see that God can use natural means to bring supernatural results. In the story of Peter, it is pretty obvious and it's pretty clear that God supernaturally intervened into his situation. But we see there's other prison breaks in the Bible where God used natural means to bring people out. For example, Joseph. Joseph was in the, in the prison and Joseph did not have a 10-year or a 15-year sentence. We actually assume that Joseph was supposed to be in prison for the rest of his life. It was most likely a life sentence. And supernaturally, God gets him out. But the way the Lord got him out is by actually using natural means. In the prison, he found a man whom he helped with the dream and this man told the Pharaoh at the point when Pharaoh had a dream and couldn't find a translation and next thing that happens it led Joseph out of the prison into the palace. God used natural means to bring supernatural results. We see also in the life of Paul when Paul was in prison for preaching the gospel that God caused an earthquake to happen and through the earthquake Apostle Paul was able to be released from the prison. But in this story we see supernatural invasion of God's angel into the prison of Peter to get him out. Before we mention the supernatural ways of God, we have to not miss that God can use natural means to bring supernatural results in our lives. There are people who will die refusing medicine because they say, I want God to heal me only supernaturally. Not knowing that the Lord can use medicine to also touch your life. There are people who will reject a certain thing that the Lord will do because they will say, well, I want only this way. Elijah did not say to God, I will not receive food from ravens. I want food like Israel in the wilderness. I want manna from heaven. I don't want unclean, unpopular, unpleasant, bad birds bring me food. If Elijah would have been picky about which way God is going to use to bring blessing into his life, Elijah would have starved to death. Naaman did exactly the same thing. He came for healing, he came for supernatural result and the prophet says go and baptize yourself seven times in the river and he says what? I don't like this. I want this but I am very picky about this. You have to be so focused on your miracle that you're not picky about the method God is going to use to bring it into your life. Can somebody say amen? It's like the story of one person who was drowning in the sea and they drowned. And they came to heaven fussing and screaming and yelling, God, why didn't you rescue me? I cry out to you and God says, I send the first boat, you decline them. I send the second boat, you said no to them. I send the third boat and you said to them that you're waiting on me. All of these three boats were actually me trying to rescue you. Many times in your life and in my life, the Lord will use natural means to bring a supernatural breakthrough in our life. And we have to be as Christians, not be so picky about the methods God's going to use but be so preoccupied with the miracle that God wants to bring into our life and not miss that for the glory of God. Amen. Same thing happens in marriage where many times you know guys or girls they recognize that they want God's best for their life. But many people are so stuck about what is God's best. They, they know for sure what is God's best for their life. He has to have this kind of hair or no hair. He has to have this kind of eyes or uh, this kind of eyes. He has to have this statue. He has to be charming. He has to be this. And so when you make the list and you miss the point that you, what you want really is loved, accepted, protected and no joker or loser in your backyard. But when you get so focused on the means that God could use, that you are so picky about that, you might get stuck with what you want, but not really get what you really, really want in your life. Can somebody say amen? 
And so it's so important to recognize God can break you out of your prison. But the way He can do it may vary from your life to someone else's. I'm so glad Paul was not in the prison. And when the earthquake happened, he said, I'm not leaving this prison. God didn't send an angel. If God sends an angel, then I'm getting out. But if God does not send an angel, I am not leaving this prison because I want exactly the same prison break as Apostle Peter. I'm not worse than him. You, might understand, you must understand, God may provide for your life differently than we will provide for your neighbor. God might heal you differently than when He will heal your neighbor. God may differently than He will deliver your neighbor. What's important is that you focus your eyes on the deliverer and the healer and on the provider. And the ways He will use will always cause you to step over your own little preferences and sometimes cause little offense to your flesh. And the God will see, do you really want the breakthrough or do you want your way? Because if you want your way, stick with your way. But if you want the breakthrough, you sometimes have to give up your way to get what I want for your life so that you can remain humble in that in Jesus' name. Can somebody say amen? amen? There are things in our life where naturally we will not be able to get far. Uh, Joseph, he experienced a prison break naturally. It was natural means that God used to bring supernatural breakthrough. In Peter's, in, in Paul's life, God used the earthquake to bring a supernatural breakthrough. But in Peter's story, the story that we read, it was supernatural. There was, no there, was natural, there was no natural explanation for this. In impossible situation, God can do the unexplainable. What happened in Peter's life was unexplainable. An angel without keys, without permission from Herod, and without any inside connection, Get in, gets inside of the prison. He did not bribe the, 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 the guards. He did not bribe the soldiers. He walks in and he delivers supernaturally Peter out of the prison. Chains fall off. He walks out. The gates open on their own. I mean, this almost sounds like a movie. Almost sounds like a, like, like a made-up story. It, it's so ridiculous that even Apostle Peter, who is a man of faith, he walks out and the Bible says he thought it was a dream. He thought it was a vision. It was so unexplainable because the situation was so impossible. We must learn to expect unexplainable when we are in situations where there is no way out. Some of you have heard the story of a gentleman in, from China who is, um, I think the story is a little bit further. Right here. Uh, Brother Yan, he's the, the book, he wrote the book called The Heavenly Man, where in China they put him in prison. And they put him in prison quite a few times in China. And the Lord always had a plan to get him out of the prison. And so supernaturally, the Lord will bring him out of the prison in a supernatural ways where he would walk out of the prison and the guards would not notice him. And the gates would be open and he would just walk out. And so our pastor actually met him in Seattle. And so this man is a real man. This is not a myth and it's not a story. And he escaped supernaturally. But there was one story in the book, and I don't remember the details of it because it was a while when I read it, where because so many times the Lord broke him out of the prison, what they did when they captured him is they broke his legs. So even when the Lord will get him out, he won't be able to get out because his legs are broken. And so they broke his legs and they put a lot of guards and they said, that's it, he will never get out. And they beat him mercilessly. He describes the brutality and the torture he went through, how physically they beat him. And he would fast for weeks without water and without food. And a particular day, the Lord revealed to him that God is going to get you out out of this impossible situation supernaturally. He said, God, there's, there's just no way. My legs are broken. I can't even walk. They carry me to the torture place. And I am so weak because I'm fasting and praying. I refuse to eat. There's no way. Until God made a way. He, he noticed that the door in his cell is open. And a voice told him inside, get up and walk out. He says, I can't get up because my legs are broken. And the voice said inside, get up and walk out. So he gets up and forgets that his legs are broken and begins to slowly walk out. As he walks out, there's guards standing there and the Holy Spirit tells him, they don't see you, keep walking. So he keeps walking the first set of guards and there is the door. He says, Lord, I don't know the password. He says, push it in. It's, gonna, it's already open. He pushes it in and the guards don't notice him. He walks through the second doors, through the second guards and nobody notices him. The camera doesn't go off. Nobody notices him until he escapes the prison 
The problem is the prison has a wall around it and there's no way he can leap over the wall because it's so high. Now that sounds ridiculous what he did next but the Lord told him to run toward the wall and he will supernaturally pick him up and put him over the wall. Now a man who sat in jail and had his legs broken have no reason to lie. And that's exactly what he did. He escapes the prison and the Spirit of God leads him. He says, go to this house. He goes to the house where the Christians are gathered. The moment he comes to the house, they already tell him, the Lord told us you're going to escape the prison and you have to leave right now because they will lock the city. As the moment he walks out from that house, the city is on the lockdown and he escapes the lockdown. And today he's a completely free man who is no longer in China but traveling and preaching the gospel. Nothing is impossible to our God. Can somebody say amen? When the situation is impossible, expect the unexplainable. You may be in something that is so challenging right now physically, in your physical health, maybe in your finances. God can use natural means to get us out. But there are moments in life where natural means are not enough. There are moments in life where medicine is not sufficient and God's grace and God's healing and miraculous power is the only thing that is going to get you out for the glory of God. Can somebody say amen? amen. You know, I, this, this year I file taxes. Every year I file taxes. And my taxes are a little bit more complicated because uh, it involves uh, rental properties and it involves um, the speaking engagements that I have and miles and, and so, many, so many other things. So they're a little bit more complicated. And this year when um, a friend of mine, he filed taxes for me, I realized that a time passed and I did not hear anything from my arrest and I did not get anything, get anything back from my arrest. And on a one fateful day, I opened my mailbox and I see a mail, a letter that says an IRS has been reviewing your file and they have questions about your taxes. Now, you, you, you will know one thing, there's two people you don't want to mess with, it's the Lord and it's IRS. And if IRS has questions about your taxes, well, you have every reason to be afraid. <laughs> you have every, I mean, I have nothing to hide. I report all of the things that come, even if I go to trips and somebody blesses me like $20, I tell IRS, somebody gave me $20. I mean, I'm very honest with everything, but I do not want them auditing me. And so what I did is I looked through that letter and I typed, explained every single thing about why I came up with a certain number on my taxes. I send that letter and everything is fine until three weeks passes and I realized that the deadline for me to send that letter is long gone and I have not heard anything from them by letter or by phone. So I decide to call IRS. I call IRS and they said, we never got your letter. So I'm pretty upset because I sent the letter. I have no proof to tell them that I sent the letter. Now the time has expired for me to explain about the things and I fear what's going to happen is they're going to start digging through my taxes and they're going to start auditing me and just literally <laughs> taking me by pieces. I send the second letter. We go to Vancouver and before we go to Vancouver for this trip this weekend, I re realized that it's been a week and I have not seen on my, you know, when you have a certified mail, you can see the tracking where the letter is, that the letter for a whole week is stuck in Spokane. So not only the first one is lost, the second one is stuck in Spokane. So I tried to call the postal office. I mean, 40 minutes later, they find the letter. They said, oh, we, we're going to have to ship it later and all this stuff. And they finally ship it a few days later into IRS. And I mean, by this time, I'm like, Lord, it's over for me. I mean, it's, it's just going to be bad. We come back from the Vancouver trip. And the interesting part is during Vancouver trip, uh, we had a certain thing on our heart to give a certain amount of money away to one particular individual. And I was thinking, I'm like, wait, I'm going to be in trouble with IRS. I think I should probably hold on with the whole giving part just in case I'm going to go down. So at least I have some money to pay them in case they're going to start penal penalizing me. But we decided to give it away anyway. We come back and I think it was on Monday. I checked the status on IRS and turns out they review my whole file and they found out that the amount of money that they owed me, that they didn't owe me enough. So they added a lot more after reviewing my file. I was like, I was like, Lord, if they have any other questions about other things on my taxes, I am more than happy to explain to them. It's interesting, something that I thought will go so against me, something that I feared could go against me, actually could churn in my favor and for my good.
because when you serve a God who can do anything you can expect the unexplainable you can expect the unexplainable can somebody say amen and the testimony is that you know this particular lady she had a MS she was diagnosed with MS and she had seizures every single day and the seizures were so severe that one time during work when she was working she had a seizure and they had to actually lay her off of work and they put her on disability because she was unpredictably in a store behind a car she could just have seizures and the seizures were very severe it came to the point where she actually had to be confined to a wheelchair a little scooter wheelchair and she was confined to it so in case she has seizures that she doesn't hurt her body but that she could live like that she was not a Christian not a believer until one of the friends that met her and told her that you need to connect to Jesus you need to read the Bible and God can heal you it was an insult to her she thought she was insulted by that but she decided to give a break and listen to the Bible. She listened to the Bible. She found it very hopeful, very encouraging. Until they took her to a particular conference, her Bible study group. She gave her life to Jesus at this conference. But prior to giving her life to Jesus at this conference, in the hotel, she had the biggest seizure in her life. It was so severe and so bad that the emergency had to come and get involved and they had to literally just release the spasms in her body. And she was convinced, she was convinced it's going to be like this for the rest of our life. Because if you know about seizures or MS, these things don't go away by medicine. They can be subsided, they can be suppressed, but they cannot be removed. At this conference, after already going to church for some time, she gives her life finally to Jesus, comes to the front. Now remember, she is on a wheelchair. She gives her life to Jesus, and the lady who prayed for her to receive Jesus, after she receives Jesus, she looks at her and she says, I command this foul spirit, of seizures to leave your body right now in Jesus name and she rebukes the foul spirit of seizures this woman says who did not believe that God could heal seizures she says I felt little darkness leave half of my body she's like and go this way out of my body and I felt so light after words that I said hey can I try to walk again I haven't walked for a while but can I walk again they said go ahead she gets up and begins to walk wow. and it's eight years since she had a last seizure Our God can do the unexplainable. Amen. There is no way you can explain how MS cannot hit a person for eight years. There is no way you can explain how this can happen. But this it happens when we are people who realize Peter was in the prison. There was no way he could get out of there. He was not connected to Pharaoh, the Herod. He was, there was no earthquake coming. But God says, listen, if I don't have the natural means, I can come supernaturally and invade your circumstances. When I was listening to the testimony of a lady named Jasmine from last Sunday from Fiji, but originally lives and right now lives in Sacramento. And she was saying all the things the demon did in her life, they were unexplainable. Unexplainable. The fact that she could come in the bed to sleep and there will be a physical person in the bed with her, sleeping between her and her husband. The fact that this being, she said physically she saw him, begins to drag her out of the bed and begins to torment her and physically speak to her and this do damages to her life. And as I'm listening to this post interview, I am like, this is unexplainable. If demons can do the unexplainable to people, how much more our God can do the unexplainable to his children. And I believe that this is the time as it's Christians today is we must recognize when you are backed in the corner and there is no way you can get out of that. Maybe you, it's the sickness, maybe it's the chronic depression, maybe it's been happening to people like that in the family and you say, you know what, I ran out of my natural options. My medicine doesn't work already. The connections I have, they're not working. I can tell you of a God who says when you don't have any other options, pick me because I can step into your situation and I can do the unexplainable. Amen. I can do the unexplainable. I can make a way where there is no way. I can put money in a fish's mouth. I can bring bread from heaven on the earth and feed millions of people for 40 years every single day except Sabbath. I can do the unexplainable. Many of us, we wait until we die to experience deliverance. If you really think about it, all of us will be free from pain during our death. All of us will be free from problems when we die. That's why many people 
take their life because they want to be free. But it doesn't take faith to wait for death to deliver you from your trouble. Our deliverer is not death. Our deliverer is Jesus Christ. And he doesn't want us to wait until we die to experience relief from depression, pain, suicide, or sickness. He wants us to experience him as a deliverer, not an event of death as our deliverer. Can somebody say amen? amen. You know, the interesting part is Peter was in this prison for the second time. And I think the devil lied to him. I think the devil was speaking to him and saying, you know what, God got you out first. But now you're here second time. God is not going to come through second time. But the devil is a liar because God came in second time. God is not just a God of first chances. He's not just a God of second chances. He is the God who anytime we call on him, he will come and he will be our deliverer and our rescuer in our situation for the glory of God. We serve a God of miracles. We serve a God of impossible. Last Sunday, there was a story of a woman in, in the synagogue church of all nations who was healed of incurable disease, lupus. And um, her kidneys were attacked. Her kidney actually failed. And her parents, if I'm not mistaken, about 25 medications she took every single day. 29? 29 medications she took every single day. And a month, she was from South Africa. Her medicine and her me medicine, uh, medical procedures cost her parents a thousand three hundred dollars it came to that point where her parents already have written her a will and they already chose a casket and they already were preparing for a funeral because of how sick she was until what happens is that she comes to the church the synagogue church of all nations which is located in lagos nigeria and she receives prayer there is no way naturally this woman could be walking and she goes back to south africa she still had the symptoms in her body. But as she goes back to South Africa and things begin to just turn around for no explainable reason, she goes to the doctor and the doctor finds out she has no trace of lupus in her body and she's completely healed. She comes back this Sunday testifying that a woman, a lady who was supposed to die, a lady who was supposed to, she already had a funeral planned. God had something else planned. While you're planning, for death God plans for deliverance Peter is there preparing for death God walks in and says I am prepared for something else and that is your deliverance if God can do it for her God can do it for you God can do it for me and God can do it for anybody when you are in an impossible situation expect the unexplainable unexplainable amen